pollinators in coastal prairie. To those of you uh, from Texas, you may not have seen this map before. This is the historic range of coastal prairie. Uh, the green is forest. All of the rest, the, the light tan and the mustard color. We have two and a half million acres approximately in Louisiana. We have, we aren't sure, maybe a little less than uh, two or three thousand acres left. It's all gone. <clears throat> and a little bit that's left are a couple of hundred acres on railroad right of ways and some grazed land uh, on some of the bigger uh, western ranches, privately owned ranches. Uh, the, uh, there's a lot in this map, uh, but I want to talk about pollinators today. So, why study and conserve pollinators? They're keystone species. Those of you with a biology degree know that term. If you remove the keystone from an arch, it collapses. Keystone species is an essential species. 75% of all of the flowering plants in the world uh, rely on pollinators to set seed. Uh, I'm trying to impress on you what that means. Uh, flowering plants are the angiosperms. The vast majority of plants on this planet are angiosperms. And 75 percent of them require pollination. Let me take a little brief sojourn into evolutionary history for those of you who haven't had pollination. Uh, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, we studied the history of the evolution of plants and animals. Uh, in the, in the, the beginning of the Jurassic, there were only a couple of angiosperms in the fossil record, much like the little rats, the little mammals. And then somewhere around 120 million years ago in the lower Cretaceous, the angiosperms expanded at an extremely fast rate, and they displaced Almost all of the gymnosperms is a dominant tree, and all of the spore-bearing plants, uh, herbaceous plants, and became the dominant life form in only about 10 or 20 million years. Charles Darwin had trouble getting his mind around that. He called it the abominable mystery. How could angiosperms have evolved and displaced other plants so quickly? It generally takes much longer time span. So why were they so successful? Insects. They made a relationship, created a relationship with insects to bring their gametes to the gametes of other plants. They didn't have to depend on wind and chance anymore. It made them extremely successful. It began a process of coevolution that's occurred ever since then. Uh, the plants evolved elaborate structures to attract the insects and elaborate devices to keep only certain insects uh, to, to get to the reward. The animals in turn evolved all kinds of modifications to do that job. And as a botanist and as a natural historian, if you want to understand flowers, you have to know what pollinates the plant because that's the other half of the story. So ecological diversity depends on pollinators. A third of all human food depends on animal pollination. And uh, you might notice it's mostly the best food. Uh, the, the latest figures I could find for 2009 are $190 billion pollinated crops brought in. Uh, pollinated plants are essential to wildlife. Uh, insect pollinated fruits and seeds are essential to the diet of 25% of birds and mammals. 90% of all bird species rely on insects at least one stage of their lives. Pretty important. And I did a bait and switch. They asked me to talk about pollinators. Since the, the evolution of pollinators, they've diversified and there are a lot of different kinds. Especially today, uh, our most charismatic species is the monarch that's been uh, Petition for listing as an endangered species and millions of dollars going into research and conservation. It's very exciting. But bees are the only pollinators that gather pollen. No other pollinators do that. 
And the adults don't eat the pollen. They bring it back and make bee bread to feed it to that larvae. No other pollinators do that. So, and, and bees have all the accoutrements to carry the pollen. Bees are the workhorses in the pollination world. So you remember I said 75% of all flowering plants rely on animal pollination. 67% of those plants rely on bees. Bees are really critical. So honeybee hive numbers have been declining since the 1950s. You've all heard that. You may not know that agricultural production that depends on honeybees has doubled since the 1950s. Uh, everybody talks about honeybees, even our Senate director, when he found out I was working on bees, he goes, well, what aspect of honeybees are you studying? And I said, not studying honeybees, they're not native. They're not native. Uh, but native bees are, are much less uh, covered, much less researched. <clears throat> but most pollination biologists believe that native bees are more, uh, are, are very effective pollinators, more effective than honeybees for many of our crops like blueberries and pears and things that I grow on my farm. And in the absence of honeybees, they believe that native bees could provide that service to pollinate our crops, not widely known. And I'm talking about bees largely because bees are an umbrella group for other pollinators. If you create habitat for bees, you're creating habitat for most other pollinators. So why are bees such consummate pollinators? They have all kinds of sophisticated adaptations in the plants they pollinate you. For instance, those of you who are flower fans know about uh, nectar guides. The plants have all these sophisticated markings that guide bees into the flower, past the anthers, and to the nectar. Uh, very sophisticated. The bees that pollinate these plants uh, fit exactly in the flower and respond to those guides. Bees have what's called flower constancy, much more so than any other group, especially butterflies. They, once a bee visits a flower and is rewarded, it has a bias for that flower and will continue to visit the same species usually. And of course, if you're trying to get pollen from one conjure to another, that's pretty handy. So uh, pollination biologists call that trap lining. They go from flower to flower to flower spreading pollen. In worldwide, there are 20,000 species. In the United States, there are 4,000 species of native bees. People find that really hard to believe. Bees evolved from wasps, but they have something unique that wasps don't have. They have plumose hairs, feather-like hairs, that are especially designed to hold pollen. And they, they range in size in North America from 2 millimeters up to 26 or 28 millimeters. The queen uh, eastern bumblebee is our largest, and we have a little bitty perdita in California, 2 millimeters, you can barely see it. So they, they're adapted to every size flower. They have all these, these great adaptations for carrying pollen. In social bees, it's a bee basket called the carbicula. In uh, uh, solitary bees, and most bees are solitary bees, they have scopa. Various parts of their body have clusters of hair where they store the pollen. They have a comb on their leg, and they rake the pollen off their bodies and pack it into that to bring it back to their nest. And the, the flowers and bees have taken a, a strategy, a variety of strategies along a continuum from specialists like this uh, hibiscus musk chutis, our marshmallow. It's pollinated, it has a specialist bee that only pollinates it. And it's the only bee that you'll ever find, that I've ever found in flower. Things like uh, Silphium gracile, these yellow sunflowers are generalists. They have hundreds of bees that visit. Every one of those pictures was taken on Silphium gracile. And uh, uh, as flowers specialize, so do bees. These are, these are three common plants that you guys may know. The hibiscus I already mentioned. False dandelion, pyropathus, grows on roadsides everywhere. Super common for a long period of time. And hawthorn, you know, mayhaw jelly, they all have specialist bees that emerge right when the plants start to flower. 
They pollinate them and they're finished by the time the plants are finished. Very carefully coordinated. And one of the problems with, with climate change is that it's generally temperature sensitivity that clues them to emerge. So there's some concern about the plant phenology changing and insect phenology doesn't. There are also a bunch of bees that are parasitic on other bees. They're kleptoparasites, like cuckoo birds. They, they hang out by the nest of a solitary bee. She makes bee bread, she lays her egg, and she goes to get mud or a leaf to close herself. The, the bee goes in, eats her egg, lays its own, and leaves. And they don't have any hair on them. They don't need it. They don't gather pollen. They just drink nectar and hang around like cuckoo birds and wait for their opportunity. What's interesting about that is that a, a couple of the big bee guys in the United States haven't published this yet, but they noticed a trend. 40 years of research indicate that this ratio, 20-60-20, is almost ubiquitous in grass, healthy grasslands. Anytime a grassland gets disturbed, the, the, the numbers change. Often it's parasitic bees that become more common when the plants are stressed. If diversity goes down, the specialists are stressed. So uh, th this is, a, is a, a criteria that we can use uh, with the data that we, we study. Um, the majority of our bees are solitary and nest in the ground. Uh, another 30% in hollow stems, hollow grass, uh, in beetle burrows and wood, but they nest in wood. Uh, and while bees may disperse a long distance when, when they first hatch out, uh, when they forage, once they start nesting, they don't go very far. Bumblebees might go a mile or two. But most small bees only travel 100 feet from their nest in their whole life. So uh, consequently, a lot of experts predict that if you look at small remnants, you can find a lot of rare bees because they, they aren't dispersing out and they, they can survive on a very small patch. A bumblebee would have a hard time, but a small bee would, would be well adapted. So how many bees do we have in southwest Louisiana? Uh, unfortunately, they, they have been very few studies and the national maps, uh, this, this central part of the, the upper Gulf Coast is a black hole, almost no data. There have only been three studies to date. One, a guy from Texas A&M came a few weekends and collected on the roadside. Uh, that's Merrill. And there have been two studies over in the Florida parishes on hillside seats and in, in uh, Longleaf Pine. No one's ever looked at the coastal prairie of Louisiana. So we, in, in 2015, we began a, a bee survey. And the reason we did this primarily is I'm a botanist and my, my entire career I've worked on prairie restoration uh, and, and prairie community dynamics. You know, how, what, what do we attribute uh, the, the diversity in prairie to? How do we restore that diversity? And, and we we're always asking, how do you know when you restore a prairie if you've succeeded? Uh, and botanists always say, well, you go see what plants are there and you know that you succeeded. But ecosystems function. And so we were looking for a measure of ecosystem function. We looked at nutrient cycling. We looked at, at, at several different criteria. Uh, and then because I did a project in graduate school on bees, it occurred to me that maybe we could look at, at what bees exist in these grasslands and see if that would, would give us some indication of ecosystem function. So we have 12 plots, uh, eight sites, and 12 plots distributed over those sites, and we have three grassland types that basically uh, are a successional grading. We have old fallow fields, we have restored prairie, and then we have prairie remnants, which should be the highest quality. <clears throat> this is a sampling method we used, and uh, just last month there was an official uh, Fish and Wildlife Service document published with a protocol. Luckily, this is a protocol that we used, and why I like this protocol is because we're really interested in getting citizen scientists like Mass and Naturalist and other groups to begin sampling bees. And it's not an easy thing to do, but this method is, can be taught in, a, in an hour. 
and, and it's really, really effective. So we use these, oh, we use these little solo cups uh, that you know you get tartar sauce in and you paint blue fluorescent, yellow fluorescent, and leave one white. And then we set up a one hectare plot and we set them about 10 meters apart on diagonal transects with soapy water in them. We set them up early in the morning, we retrieve them in the afternoon, and you'd be surprised how easily fooled the bees are. They, they go into the trap and drown. Then we use, this is called the blue vein trap, it's much bigger, uh, and it has baffles, and the bees flying in the baffles falling and drown. And this tends to collect large bees. This tends to collect very small bees. So you get a, a, a very good sample. The, the advantage of this is anybody can learn to do it. It's eminently repeatable. You know, it, we do it the same way. There's no observer bias in biology. The disadvantage is there are a very small subset of bees attract. The majority of bees don't fall for it. So you don't get a good idea of what's actually in the, uh, uh, in the plot. The second method we use is net. We do, uh, we net for, for uh, two man hours in the morning, two man hours in the afternoon. By that I mean that two of us we do it for an hour is when we do it for two hours. And we carry this little uh, pouch with canisters of soapy water and we keep track of what flowers we collect and what bees on. So every canister is for a separate plant species. Uh, another thing that we do when we arrive at the site is we try and quantify what we call floral density. That's how, how many flowers there are. By the way, if you see the flower, it's probably insect pollinated. If it's wind pollinated, the plant doesn't waste any time making petals. Like, uh, anybody ever see uh, uh, ragweed flowers? They're, they're little tiny. Yeah, those of you who know it, they're the tiny little little green things and they're flowering next to to goldenrod and everybody goes, I'm allergic to goldenrod. I said, no you aren't. You're allergic to the plant next to it. Go, what? I don't even see it. So wind pollinated things are not showing. So we go through and we make a list of every flowering plant that's in bloom and we put them in, a, in an abundance category. 1 to 10, 11 to 100 and so on. So that we get a measure of, of how many flowering plants there are at the site. And then the third thing we do is a little more technical. We do a formal vegetation assessment in the plot. We do 30 quadrats that are a, a quarter meter square. Uh, we list every plant and the, and the uh, coverage of that species, how much bare ground, what percentage is bare ground, what percent is dead litter, which gives you a clue to the fuel content. And we use that to calculate these parameters. Species richness, which we think is very important, evenness, uh, grass forb ratio, floral quality, and structure. So the uh, amount of ground that you can see through the vegetation is the measure of structure. Those are all variables that we're going to use to analyze the data. What's floral quality? Floral quality is uh, uh, it's a system that was first used in the Chicago area. Uh, where experts rate plants in an ecosystem based on, uh, I like to say, how excited a botanist is when he sees it, but that's not even <laughs> logical principle. It's how susceptible is a plant to disturbance. So if, if you walked up to a pristine prairie and you looked at it and you tethered your horse there and the horse started trampling it, the first on a scale of zero to 10, the first thing to disappear would be the tenth, and then the nines, and the eights, and the seventh. Starting from the other direction, if you plowed the ground, the first thing to come up would be a zero, then a one, then a two, then a three. So it follows succession. So we did that for the plants in Louisiana. Someone's done it for Texas, and they have been uh, all over the Midwest and prairie areas. People have gone out and, and done. In fact, you have in your packet the paper that that uh, I and a group of us published in floral quality uh, with all the values for our plants. So if you want to restore a prairie, plant something seven or above on that list. Those are prairie plants. Uh, that's floral quality. Uh, so 
this, I, I just pulled this information together real quickly. It's not a formal analysis, but in, so far this year we've, we've got uh, about 1,300 individual bees at the sites. And we're trying to identify them. We only have 32 species identified, but we have a lot that aren't. And uh, these are the, uh, the, the 12 sites at the bottom. Those are the old fields. Unfortunately, one of my sites got plowed, so I had to abandon it. We, we set up another one. But uh, our most productive site, this is bee abundance, by the way, it's just sheer numbers. It's not diversity. You can't do that until we identify the bees. This old field site had the most bees. Uh, these two, uh, about middle of the range, but they didn't have the floral diversity that these sites had. <clears throat> the prairie rodents, much to my surprise and dismay, were not the most diverse. Uh, they, they had relatively low numbers of pollinators. Restorations were where all the bees were. And we, I, I can't say definitively why that is, but I'll tell you it's related to how many things were in flower, floral density. The, the prairie restorations were grazed and they just didn't have as many flowers as the, as the restorations did. Uh, but anyway, when we analyze the data, I think we're going to see a different pattern with uh, uh, bee diversity. I think the remnants will have a greater number of kinds of bees. So again, one of the things we did was we kept track of which plants we found bees on. And uh, by the way, that's that, that's a rattlesnake master. That's an inflorescence about a little bit bigger than a, than a big marble. Those bees are really tiny. Um, so here's the, the rough data, the rough data for what we collected. Over the two years, we've gotten almost 3,000 bees, and we're only two-thirds of the way through our collection season. But in pan traps, a third of them were in pan traps. The other two-thirds we caught in flowers. So that, that's pretty incredible. That's a pretty good technique that I think we can use for inventory and monitoring. These are the plant species and how many we, we caught on each plant species. This was a real eye opener for me. So the ones in red are weeds. And look what weeds they are. The, the third to, uh, the plant that had the third to highest abundance is a non-native invasive exotic. Plant. Not highly invasive, but, it, but it's very, very common at disturbed sites for being a Brazilianensis. Butterflies and bees love that plant, even though it's not native. And, you know, of course, uh, thistle, and, and you recognize this, we called it bitterweed when I was growing up. Cows eat it, makes the milk bitter. Uh, this, this is a fantastic pollinator plant. But look, McCartney Rose. In Louisiana, we don't we don't understand the Texans dislike of this plant, but uh, a lot of a lot of a lot of bees like it. Uh, we tried to 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 get representative plots, so we generally had at least some portion of our plot that was wet. And we had a lot of wetland plants in there. It's surprising how many wetland plants are actively visited by bees. And these are the species that were uh, most abundant. Uh, so. You know, they were abundant, had a lot of bees, that, that makes perfect sense. But uh, someone asked me this morning about Coreopsis tinctoria. He said, it's such a beautiful plant, I want to plant a whole field on it. Well, guess what? Almost never found any bees on it. This is it. It grows wild on my farm. I love it. It's beautiful. I never see anything visiting. I don't know why. Uh, so, <clears throat> in, in the process of uh, Doing a literature search and preparing for this study, we outlined a series of hypotheses of uh, what bees would respond to and what would explain bee abundance and diversity. And these, these are some of the, the hypotheses that we hope to test in this study. One is that distance from agriculture makes a difference. And we have an anecdotal case. That's the, the uh, all of the restorations had a lot of bees except one. A 300-acre restoration is surrounded by soybeans and rice. There were no very few bees on it. 
And twice while we were out there sampling, the crop dusters came and turned over our heads with the, with their sprayers open. You know, so I, you know I suspect that 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 has an effect. I might say uh, mosquito control spray probably also has a big effect. Habitat size, I'm I'm sure, is important. That's a no-brainer. And connectivity too. So. When you have a patch, how far is it from the other patch, and can you connect those patches? One of the things that we thought we could do is if we if we could discover how to make a restoration or an old field, uh, high quality pollinated habitat, we could use that to connect runners. It'd be a lot cheaper than trying to you know just you just stop farming it and let it go fallow, and it has value to pollinators. It's amazing. And if you use a little bit of seeding of, of you know, wildflower, you can create habitat that will create that will connect runs. <clears throat> Diversity, abundance, and temporal availability ability of floral resources. I, I'm convinced this is probably the most important. If if you build it, they will come. If you have the flowers there, uh, the bees will find them and use them. So abundance of wildflowers is very important. But uh, and diversity is too. You have to have a lot of different species because you have a lot of specialists and you have uh, various bees will switch. They'll use one plant one day and another plant another day, but I, I don't know what reason. Oh, I might also say temporal availability. These, these bees, some of the bees like bumblebees live all year and they need resources. They can't take it. A month in the summer with no floral resources. You have to have something in flower that satisfies their, their pollen and nectar demands throughout the growing season. A big quality habitat. So availability of appropriate nesting conditions. Remember I said they nest in bare ground. Uh, if, if you can find ditch banks, eroded ditch banks, and, and bare soil that's normally bare ground, believe it or not, a lot of times cattle trails We'll have bees nesting along the worn cattle trails. Uh, bare ground, uh, wet areas because the bees use mud to seal their, their cells when they're laying eggs. And, and some of them, like the hibiscus, they actually nest in mud. And, and dead or senesced woody plants. As much as prairie people hate woody plants, uh, a dead branch, a dead tree is, is terrific habitat for 30% of all the bees that occur. Uh, try and, and restrict non-native plants in, in your uh, habitat, particularly things that are invasive and not used by bees like, like King Ranch blue stem and things that might outcompete uh, our native forms. And this is, a, this is one that just came to my attention uh, uh, last year at my visit to, uh, to the uh, Nature Conservancy's uh, Prairie Chicken Preserve in Texas City. <clears throat> Turns out that they think fire ants are largely responsible for low arthropod abundance in grasslands. And they long suspected that fire ants had an effect on prairie chickens' ability to raise a brood of prairie chickens. And they thought maybe that fire ants were killing the young in the nest. Now they think fire ants are actually killing the insects. And the, the, the crustaceans and the millipedes and centipedes and earwigs, all the things that, that make up arthropod biomass in the grassland, fire ants are reducing that and they depend on that to feed their young. So the young, they aren't able to fledge their young. Uh, in fact, I, I understand that Atwater Prairie Chicken did a study where they poisoned ants on half the 2,000 acre site and, and actually had uh, some birds successfully fledged where they poisoned fire ants. So it's a real dilemma for environmentalists, but uh, uh, there's, there's no good fire ant, safe fire ant poison that I know of. Uh, I don't think there are any that are labeled for cattle. You know, Farrah, I haven't been able to find any that, that you can use in, in, on graze plant safely. So, uh, I have two two things that I'd like to uh, to end on here. The uh, uh, this is a uh, a quote I came across in the research. Uh, Biotic information derived solely from megabiota 
presents a skewed view of ecosystem dynamics. So if we only look at the big charismatic things, uh, we're not going to do a very good job of conservation plan. Uh, and uh, arthropods, insects, are the red-headed stepchildren of the biological world, but we need to spend more time looking not just at pollinators, but, uh, but arthropods in general. Information derived from arthropod species assemblages can be used to characterize accurately almost any aspect of an ecosystem. But while they're not easy to study, they are uh, uh, really, really important. And uh, that's the end of my talk. You guys have any? Larry, I'm going to ask you a question first, and then maybe some other folks will have some. So when you're, when you're learning about uh, bees in Louisiana or in the coastal prairie or, or other associated pollinators, what are some of your go-to resources that, that you use as you, as you learn about these, these, these critters? There's, there's a, lot of, uh, a lot of literature coming out right now. One of the reasons that bees have not been studied in much detail is because there's a real paucity of taxonomic expertise. Uh, there's nobody in Louisiana who identifies bees. Uh, I take that back. There's a graduate student who's learning how. But there are only a few bee experts in the country. And the bee taxonomy is pretty complicated and not easily learned, especially to get them to species. So that's a real limiting factor. But there, uh, in Texas, uh, you guys have uh, John Neff down in, in uh, uh, South Texas. Um, we, we have a guy in the USGS, uh, Sam Drogi. There's a guy in, in Missouri, Mike Arduja. These, these guys are, are uh, it's amazing how uh, uh, willing they are to help newbies and to, to identify things. The B Lab in Utah and there's a B Lab in, in Bellsville, Maryland will identify a small number of bees. But uh, there really is a, a, a substantial literature on bees, but, but most of it's been done in the West. Uh, so uh, we're kind of plowing new ground. Does that answer your question? Yeah? Yeah. OK. Yes. What, what book would you recommend for oh, amateurs? I should, I should have taken a picture. There's a great one that, that came out. It's bees in Your Backyard is the name of it. If you have the slightest interest in bees, you need a copy of it. photography. Never seen photography like this. They do a really good job of showing you high quality images of all the major groups. They talk about their natural history. And uh, it, it's a fun read for the light person, and, and it's been a real resource for me. Uh, when you, you, you go up a notch to the bees of Eastern North America, two volume set, very effective. And in Bees of the World by John Michener there. There, there are several very technical keys, uh, but, but I suggest that you start. There's also a, a, a book on bumblebees that's just on bumblebees, and it's very good, too. Uh, I, I might put a plug in here for those of you who haven't noticed. We have a hands-on bee exhibit set up in the hall right past the, the uh, tables in the hall next door. And uh, we, we set up some examples of some of the big bees and give you an idea of the kinds of things that help you identify bees. Uh, one of, the, one of the, the fun things that everybody likes to do is be able to identify tell bumblebees from carpenter bees. And it's, it's relatively easy. What most people don't know is that only female bees stink. And male carpenter bees have a big yellow face and the female face is black. And the female is shy. They avoid people. The males get in your face. And so if you've ever been around and had one in your face, grab them with your hand and you can win friends and influence people. <laughs> <laughs> Just make sure it has a yellow face. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you had a question about, you had, you had um, a slide that said that there was uh, a correlation between abundance and diversity of bees and the number of flowering plants. Yeah. Uh, does that also extend to the inflorescence of the naked grasses, or is that basically not really done by bees? Uh, 
Not when it comes to, to pollinators. I, I don't think that, that native grasses are wind pollinated. So I, I don't think that, although uh, bees visit grasses, uh, my friend Scott Edwards, who's going to talk a little earlier, sent me a picture of bees visiting big blue stem ones. And uh, we were out by Eastern Gamma grass, and there was a, the two spotted longhorn bee, Melisoites by maculata. There were hundreds of them visiting big blue stem, but that's rare. Uh, there's a correlation between plant diversity and insect diversity. It's been clearly demonstrated. And there seems to be a correlation between bee abundance and diversity and, and insect pollinated plant, plants. Uh, so it's not diversity in general. So yeah, you have to have four diversity for bees. Does that answer your question? Right, so basically, I understand the forbs are more attracted to bees than the, the native grasses, or of course the native grasses are Well, you need native grass. I mean, you don't plant it just for pollinate. Right. In the first place, you need grass so it'll burn. If you're a real bird person, you right. know, you gotta burn it. And grass is a fuel plant, so. We uh, did an amateur trapping study at a couple of pocket prairies in Houston that had been established by the Katy Prairie Conservancy. We took the bees up to Jack Neff, and he said we had about 26 species, including one that had not been seen north of the lower Rio Grande Valley. Uh, the question is, is there one or more places, academic institutions or otherwise, where you know, we could approach people and try to get in line for uh, more formal studies by professionals? Uh, so, are you asking me if, if we can recruit professionals to study, or do you want to mean professionals to identify your needs? Well, uh, we realize there are relatively few people who do this, and we're not sure where to go to get them identified. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's a dilemma for me, too. I find lucky enough to find a graduate student who's a, a study, doing a PhD in, in beetle taxonomy, and she's just a wizard. And she started doing bees, and she's very good. So she's helping me do my bees. And when we're both satisfied, we're right. Then we're going to send them to a real bee expert to, to confirm them. Uh, but uh, uh, we, we, we had a bee training class here last December. And we're going to try and repeat that this year to try and get that skill in the hands of uh, people who do it. But. Uh, while, while many bees are relatively easy to get to species, they have some. Remember the little tiny bees on that inflorescence? You have to dissect the genitalia. There are 250 species of that genera, and you have to dissect the genitalia in a four millimeter form. Uh, so that's, that's not in the, the, the realm of viewability for the average amateur or, or me. Uh, but uh, yeah, we need, we need to figure out how to get more, more uh, taxonomic expertise. Yeah, Bill. Uh, Sam Houston State University comes to mind. Potentially, uh, John Pastorella. Oh, I'm sorry, I forgot about John. Yeah, we had a, we have a, a a guy who has worked with bees a lot and is very good, very good at taxonomy. While he didn't train in bee taxonomy, and he's in Texas now. At, where is he? At Sam Houston. Sam Houston. Houston. Uh, John Pastorella. He's the head of their biology department. And just a couple of years ago, and uh, he's going to be doing some studies around Texas and uh, in, in your neck of the woods. Very confident guy, and he, he trains students to identify him. So I, I, I would approach him if you have a study in mind to see if, uh, if you know if he couldn't uh, use some of his graduate students to help him do that. Thanks, Bill. Any other? Yes. Oh, no. Habitat. I've had good luck with uh, beetle breeding logs and also the other two, but I've had very poor luck with the air around. I try to use, you know, yeah. all the roots and stuff yeah. like that. Try to keep it from coming back to vegetation. I don't know. I don't know. I can't hear you. I can hear. He said that that he's had really good luck using uh, drilled wood and cardboard tubes, cavity nesting. Mm -hmm but not with bare ground. I don't know how you recruit bees to bare ground. Uh, if, you, if you put up uh, a block of wood drilled with holes, they'll find it, but not so with bare, bare ground. Uh, but I can tell you that we find ground nesting bees everywhere, and I don't know where they're nesting. I, I think they sometimes are 
in a grassy lawn, you know, in between clumps of grass where you can't see them. Yes? Uh, one thing about uh, setting up nesting boxes, we tried that at the West Love Street Park in Houston, and uh, we had boxes just kind of barely inside the canopy and taken over by ants immediately. So, uh, you know, it would be good to use uh, some tangle coat or something on the stake to keep the ants out. 60% of our native bees are ground nesting fire ants. If they find the nest, you know, they're tenacious and, and they'll destroy them. It's a real problem. And I'll mention another problem. Uh, for those of you, before I was a biologist, you know, I was, I was a nature lover and I, and I often did things that I heard were good for the environment. I wanted to become a biologist to find that I had an oversimplified view of things. But when you put up these blocks of wood drilled with holes or these, these bee nests, you create habitat for, for bees. But when you get all the bees nesting in the same place, it's real easy for parasites. So what they've discovered is the first year or two, the, the bee population flourishes until the parasites find them, and then the parasite population flourishes. And they end up eating all the larval bees or, or, or eating the eggs and, you know, uh, and destroying the local bees. So um, it's much better to, to, to have a dead snag. You know, beetles will find it and burrow into it, and then they'll, they'll occupy the beetle burrow. And they, it's amazing how they find it. Uh, I had hundreds of leaf cutter bees in my wood pile the year after I cut it. They looked like gnats when I first saw them. So they find the holes pretty easily. Any other questions? I thank that. Yeah. <laughs> 